Well, hello everyone and welcome to another History Indoors talk. It is great to have you along for this and we hope that you will enjoy this talk. Um, just a few things really before I pass over to our speaker this 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 this, this evening. Um, if you haven't subscribed to History Indoors, please, please do. Please subscribe, press that subscribe button, follow us on our journey because we've got a lot of things going on in our, in our in, you know, with, with what we do. We'd love to have you on board. We are getting now near the uh, 1,600 mark, I think, as well. So we'd love to have you join us on, on that. So do press that subscribe button. Do, do like the video as well. Um, do let us know where you're from. You know, it'd be great to, to have you let us know where you are actually are tuning in from because we want to, uh, well, kind of have you join us in that. So please do uh, let us know where you're from as well and and like. Do follow us on most social media accounts that we that we do run as well. Um, what else do you don't need to say? I can't remember now. This is this is when, when you don't turn so, so, so often you, you forget. Um, but no, like I said we, we hope you really enjoy. We got we got more talks coming up after this as well, and we've got talks coming in the new year. So again, do subscribe, like this because we have got a lot of stuff going on in the future of history indoors. Um, that being said, uh, that's enough for me. I think I think what, I mean, one thing I do need to say actually is that there will be Q and A afterwards. So please do. Think about questions and answers and at the end we can ask some questions and see where we go so do do think about that think about some questions as as the talk goes on and we can look at them at the end of the talk uh, but that's enough about history indoors you're not here to listen to me ramble on about history indoors if you were i'd be worried um instead you're here to, uh, to listen to uh andrew um who who we're so thankful thankful for for andrew for you know, to wanted to give us a, give a talk to us on on this really interesting topic something that i know very little about so i'm looking forward to kind of engaging with this uh, and seeing what's about so thank you andrew i, th I think you, you you've just recently finished your ma as well um so oh. um which is absolutely fantastic so congratulations on that as well um so we c cannot wait i will pass over to you and um yeah i'm looking forward to this so i'll say bye for now and i'll see you at the end of the talk Okay, then. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, so my name's Andrew Harrison. I've recently been uh, awarded my MA uh, by research uh, on um, the Normandy campaign, and it's called Con Cobra Confusion. And I sort of like called that, uh, called tonight's uh, stuff, uh, tonight's talk on that. As you, as you can tell, probably I'm a little bit nervous about this. I don't know why, because my job is talking to people all the time, the great unwash and, and whatever. But um, talking to people who know a little bit about it as well is always a bit off-putting so if you know more than me give me a break and if anyone has i know this is mostly a uh, a free to air talk but if anyone has uh, has been unfortunate enough to pay for this i would say straight from the start no refunds okay then mm. so i must say as well joking aside um and that was a joke by the way um that i'm not here to act as a uh, a monty fanboy or to say that monty never did anything wrong because let's face it, Monty was a pain in the ass to most people. If you leave, left Monty in a room with a Swiss cheese plant, before you know where you are, the Swiss cheese plant would probably have thrown itself off the uh, the table and broken itself to get away from him. But I do think he's had a bum rap over the years, especially for Normandy. So I'm not here to, 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 to denigrate uh, previous historians or to go through a line by line rebuttal of stuff that's been written before. I'm just hoping to plant a seed of doubt in anyone's minds who might have thought well Monty what the hell was he what, what was the good of him so anyway without further ado and oh I'm going to say as well I sort of wrote a uh, a script for this and I've sort of wrote some some um, some cards but I'm going to alternate between the two so I hope it doesn't sound too dis disjointed anyway so slide one introduction so first core will capture Kong so on the face of it, there's very little grey area about that. Second Army gave General Crocker a first call, that definitive order, and yet Kong remained uncaptured until the 9th of July. So from the 6th of June to the 9th of July, um, it remained uncaptured. Uh, and it stayed that way um, until, as I say, 9th of July. And then the breakout itself uh, by the Americans didn't happen until the, <clears throat> excuse me, the 20th, 25th of July, with Operation Cobra, um, mounted by the Americans. 
Of all the operations connected with the overall Monty, uh, Normandy campaign, I don't think any have generated more heat but less light than the Battle for Car amongst historians and those who uh, were, were charged with overseeing the various Allied formations. So what was it that made Monty insist both at the time and, and afterwards that the operation went according to plan or la largely according to plan? If Monty was right, somebody must have been wrong. So what is it that keeps Monty's reputation for overcaution intact? And does it really matter? Well, I think it does. And by the end of this uh, chinwag, I hope you think it, it matters too. So side, uh, slide two, Maestro. So why was Kong so important? Well, Kong was crucial to the control of the road network in Normandy and also to the approaches to Brittany, where the Americans were going to break out. And it would make the Germans' task of switching reinforcements from the Pas de Calais area and those in Belgium and Holland more difficult if Kong was taken. It would also restrict the transfer of German units from Caen in the area facing um, the, the uh, British and Canadians uh, over to the American sector of the front. And the more panzers that faced the Anglo-Canadians, the easier it was in relative terms, or would be, for the Americans to break free once it came their time. And also airfields, let's not forget that. The capture of Caen and the surrounding countryside um, would not only provide better tank country, which was true, I mean, anywhere in Normandy is lazy tank, tank country in, in, in the invasion, immediate invasion area. Um, you'll see a photograph later on uh, just showing you just how poor it was. Um, it would also facilitate the construction of Allied airfields, um, which in turn would provide more effective close air support for the Allies on the ground. And this is something that um, Monty was very fixated on and, and knew the value of right from the get-go. Back in March uh, 1944, he wrote a paper called Some Army Problems, and we'll return to this a little bit later. And in it, he said, as we secure airfields and good areas for making airfields, so we get increased air support, and so everything becomes easier. He also went on to say that those, those air, air, airfields and the grains for them would be uh, provided as early as Second Army can manage. And that was one of those caveats that uh, came back to haunt him. Anyhow, so... That's that. Slide three, Maestro. So, <laughs> this made me laugh, this photo. Look, look at the king there. If, if ever there was a person wishing he was somewhere else, it was, uh, it was the king. But this was taken uh, in, in uh, August, uh, no, September 1944, after, after uh, the Normandy campaign. But you can see that the king never did get used to uh, a, a Monty presentation. Anyway. Monty had uh, a way of um, issuing orders, um, his, his notion of personal command, which on the face of it sounds very, very modern. He wrote, I, I issue no written orders, I read no paper. I expect everyone to act on my verbal orders, in battle or out of it. I like my army commanders to ring me up on the telephone, direct, or come to see me and discuss their problems whenever they like. I'm sure they relish that prospect. Um, and it's this preference um, uh, for the, the type of command which is often used against Montgomery, although he would um, see the plan as presented as going the way he intended, he was often pig-headed enough not to take his, his, um, his, his seniors into his confidence if things didn't go, I wouldn't say exactly to plan, but the, the plan as, 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 as presented on the face of it didn't always go as others thought it would. So, and rather than just... Um, take someone into their confidence like Eisenhower or whoever and say look well this is what you thought I meant but this is actually what we meant and this was what I said before was just a statement of, 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 of intent that's a modern phrase but whatever the the the, 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 the the phrase at the time would have been rather than do that he would just stick pig-headedly to whatever it is Monty had decided and it's that that came back to haunting. Ah, so thunderclap the plans for Neptune, which was the naval elements of, of, uh, of the Normandy landings, and Overlord were outlined by Monty and others, because others did get a look in, despite Monty's best efforts, in the course of two presentations in April and May 1944, and these were called Operation Thunderclap. So these were two presentations were designed to lay out the plan and iron out any questions that anyone might have had, um, and let the senior officers get things out of the way, uh, and then before the, the, the final planning uh, took place. And in the last uh, uh, Thunderclap presentation, Eisenhower actually stood up and said, before it, before it started, 
if anyone sees anything wrong with this plan, then it is your duty, regardless of, to say something. And nobody did. And that's an important thing to, 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 to bear in mind there. Nobody stood up. Not then, not later, not until the landing started. So, at face value, his intentions for the Anglo-Canadians and the American forces seem clear, seem clear enough. Armoured columns must penetrate deep inland and quickly on D-Day. We must peg out claims well inland. So Monty's intentions regarding what was expected of the British Second Army seems to have been clearly understood and was reflected in his order to First Corps. Remember we saw that earlier? First Corps will capture Con. So then, slide four, please. So there he is. That is the master of pragmatism himself. I'm going to give him that name. Uh, General John Crocker. So he's a general officer commanding the First Corps. So First Corps, um, their order to 3rd British Infantry Division contain the following line. And this is an, one of the most important lines, I think, in any order uh, to do with the Normandy invasion. 3rd so British Infantry Division should, by the evening of D-Day, have captured or effectively masked Caen and be disposed in depth with brigade locations firmly established. So captured or effectively masked. Okay, so bearing in mind that Caen is nearly nine miles, nine miles from Sword Beach, where the 3rd British Infantry Division was going to land, and also Sword was the smallest beach of all of the invasion forces, um, that is pragmatism writ, writ, writ large. There was no way, I think, that Monty seriously thought that uh, Caen was going to be taken on, on, on D-Day or shortly thereafter, and um, Crocker's, Crocker's order to, to 3rd British Infantry Division that spelled it out for anyone who wanted to see, wanted to, to read it. Remember, Monty, he didn't read any paper, but that doesn't mean to say that he wouldn't have been aware of first of, of, uh, of first cause order to, th to third British division, because he may not have read, read any paper, but you bet your bottom dollar that his uh, chief of staff, Frieda Gwingand, uh, would have been aware of it. And he would have told his boss. So why is this pragma pragmatism so important to the understanding of Monty's plan for Caen and the early stages of the overall campaign. So in that briefing note, drawn up by Montgomery in March 44, some army problems, the one we looked at earlier, he un underlined the initial, initial sentence, we must get ashore. Now I've seen that order in the Imperial War Museum in Monty's own scrawly handwriting, and I've seen the transcript uh, as well, the typewritten one, and in both versions, we must get ashore is underlined really really thickly in the in the monty handwritten one so that head and shoulders that is more important than anything else on did we must get ashore and stay ashore more importantly so monty's insistence during the thunderclap presentation that claims must be pegged out when in land which in turn were emphasized by general crocker's order to third british infantry division that brigades must be established in depth with can't bast or taken they amount to the same thing when seen in the wider context of Neptune and Overlord. So I don't think there's any argument with that. And I don't think anyone who would have seen that and been aware of those plans could have, could have argued Monty laid it out as his intentions. We've got to get insured. We've got to, we've got to peg out claims well inland. And that is reflected in, in Crocker's order to 3rd Infantry Division. It's, it's as clear as day. Okay, then. So... Failure to get ashore, Monty was, was re basically re-emphasizing, re failure to sh get ashore and stay there would nullify months and months, if not years of planning. It would leave Northwest Europe in the hands of Germany and delay another Allied attempt indefinitely. Um, I think it's fair to say that if, Mon if Normandy had failed, then um, Germany first as a policy would have probably taken a back seat and America would have turned to the Pacific. So the, the, the and Monty would have been aware of that as well. Wherever else he was, he wasn't stupid. Um, so getting ashore, staying ashore, and making sure that if Kong wasn't taken, then at least it was masked, amounted to a, to a, to a success in his, in his book. <clears throat> right then, we must get ashore. Now, I appreciate that everything we've said so far, in fact, everything we're going to look at in the course of this talk is pretty well condensed. You know, there's no point in saying it's not, but um, for all the countless millions of words written about Monty's Normandy campaign, it really can be boiled down to this. Caen, whether it was captured or masked, 
had indeed served and it would serve and go on to serve Monty's original purpose, the purpose which Monty had in mind from the beginning. Once that's appreciated, I believe anyway, then everything else falls into place. And it's important to think, to, to bear in mind that even though I think that's, that, that's glaringly obvious, it was obvious to people like Basil Little Hart as well. I know Basil Little Hart was a one time friend of Monty because they, he and Monty fell out, which was the Monty way of doing things. Um, but he was speaking Basil Little Hart to, um, to Patton. Uh, in the middle of June 1944. And Patton was basically uh, saying that, um, well, the British aren't getting anywhere. They're, they're taking too long to do it. They're not capturing uh, any any ground. And, you know, they're just basically doing a very bad job. To which Basil Little Hart turned around and said, to his credit, and I don't think he was defending uh, Monty in the slightest because he wasn't that sort of person because he had, he had fallen out good and proper. He was saying, well, hold on, uh, George. What you've got to remember is that the British and the Canadians, they are pulling all the Panzers, or the majority of the Panzers and other reinforcements onto Col and in the area. Uh, so it, it, pulling them away from, um, from from the American sector. So it'll give you a better idea and a better way and a more easier time to break out come the time. Now, Basil Little Hart, he wasn't privy to uh, the Thunderclap, Thunderclap presentations, um, but he recognised as many other people would have recognized the plan overall, no matter what anyone else, the, the, the former Cossack um, uh, leadership uh, who, who did the initial planning for for Overlord or what became Overlord, everyone else, Bradley post-war, um, various other people, he recognized what uh, Monty's plan was all about. And it didn't take, you know, it, 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 it was obvious then, and to me at least, it's obvious now. Anyway, slide five, please, Maestro. So, <clears throat> Kong, D-Day and beyond. Well, 3rd British Infantry Division failed to reach Kong on D-Day, but they did ensure that the city was effectively masked. I think we can, we can acknowledge that as per first cause order, orders. Congestion on Sword Beach combined with the effects of the two major, two major strong German strong points, uh, the famous Morris and Hillman, delayed the forming up and the advance of the forces allotted by 3rd Division. By the time the brigade assi assigned to uh, advance on car had, 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 had congregated and moved off, it was it was miles too late. They didn't start off until about half past one in the afternoon of D Day. Um, it was it wasn't even a full brigade at that at that time. Um, Sword Beach, I said earlier, was the smallest beach of the of the invasion beaches. It was it was so small in fact that they could only land one brigade at a time on there instead of the usual two of the two. And also, it was tiny compared to the others, and it was the first uh, beach post-invasion um, to be closed down uh, once it had served its purpose. So really, I don't believe, that's another reason why I don't believe anyone uh, at, uh, at 21st Army Group, certainly not uh, Montgomery, thought that it was going to be realistic to uh, capture a car on day one, or even you know, at all within the first few days. I'm not sure they thought it would take as long as it did, but remember, captured or masked, it still did its job. Anyway. Um, so, and there's another thing to bear in mind as well, before I go back on myself, is when you think about the actual force that was that was uh, grouped together to start the march on Hong Kong, it was basically uh, no more than one, uh, one, one battalion with um, two troops up front, two, two troops of tanks up front. That is a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of, of soldiers and soldiery and equipment to advance uh, nine miles anywhere. In fact, it has to be borne in mind that many of the um, the, the, the objectives for D-Day went uh, unmet. But just like Monty said, we must get ashore and stay ashore and peg out enough ground. And that's exactly what they did. OK. so. I think that the uh, unacknowledged flexibility, which was built into Monty's plan, went unmentioned uh, during the Thunderclap presentations and unnoticed. Like so many other objectives not achieved that momentous day, Kong's uh, retention by the enemy was but one of the many examples where it was the one with the most far-reaching of consequences, and that would so dissent amongst the Allies and at the same time damage Montgomery's reputation in the process. If he had taken Eisenhower into his confidence by on D plus three or four, much of the subsequent uh, uh, 
chutzpah would have been would have been it just wouldn't have happened anyway that's what i think that it didn't though that is down entirely to monty you know it's it's monty's got to bear the blame for that anyhow side six oh uh, slide six rather airfields and air cover well there we have an rf mitchell bomber flying over the uh the, the front um dropping its bombs in concert with many of its uh, brothers so on 8th of june 1944 two days after d-day just two days after d-day the head of the american ninth uh, tactical air force pete casada he landed his uh, his aircraft on an airstrip an operational airstrip just behind utah beach that same day spitfires of the rf's 144 wing they also landed on a similar airstrip to the rear of gold beach other airstrips followed such as the one used by the uh, rf typhoons at punta on the 14th of june but for air marshal sir arthur tedder who was as you as you all know eisenhower's deputy it was too slow a builder they had an air plan uh, and that air plan included the building of airfields and it didn't match up to uh, the, the plan pre-invasion so monty uh, as we saw earlier uh, had been fully alive to the need for the establishment of airfields in normandy and i'm going to repeat that as we secure airfields so we get increased air support and so everything becomes easier it is very important that the area to the southeast of Caen should be secured as early as second army can manage for monty the importance of air power and the security it provide to his troops on the ground was considered vital and he never lost the idea or the thought or the intention of of, of, of maintaining enough airspace or enough ground space rather for, for airstrips but equally indisputable i think was the fact that although the airfield plan did fall behind schedule whilst the allied armies were in the normandy bridgehead they never once lacked for air support the allies never did and it would have come as something as a surprise to the germans and a revelation if uh that tether and the, and the air faction thought, uh, thought thought otherwise it just wasn't ever a thing and it's i always find it you know uh amazing to see how much or how soon or how fully uh the airmen fell out with monty and if you can consider what uh i'm going to give it really a, a section here in a letter uh sent to from conning uh, from, from uh, arthur cunningham uh to um to his boss in uh, in 19 um where was it in 1942 okay he said, and this is when he, in the desert, the first time he met Monty, he says, I have now been with the army in this desert for over a year and have seen three army commanders and two corps commanders come and go. But we have a man, a great soldier, if I am any judge, and we will go all the way with him. So Cunningham couldn't, couldn't have sung Monty's, Monty's uh, praises any higher than that. But it's... Uh, Monty being Monty, he, he soon blotted his copybook. It wasn't all down to Monty, it has to be said, but he, Monty didn't help. Um, and yeah, so that just gives you a good example of how someone can go uh, from, 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 from loving him to hating him. Well, not loving him, but you know what I mean. I think also as well that other airmen, I think they changed their tune uh, about Monty depending on the sort of missions they flew. Um, for example, I don't know if anyone's ever re uh, read uh, Wing Commander um, by excuse me was by desmond scott desmond scott was very very critical of monty uh, and of the army in general but johnny johnson um who flew so um scott flew um uh, typhoons ground attack aircraft and they had one of the roughest jobs uh in in in, in the war but people like johnny johnson in his book he wrote that um because he was um at one of the thunderclap presentations he said that by and large the plan went to plan and he thought uh, it was run pretty well but if you consider that johnny johnson and his uh, his fellow pilots flew spitfires who rarely did dedicated ground attack air uh, uh, missions and scott and company did um the, the nitty-gritty i think you can you can see why the two sorts of uh, of airmen uh, might have had slightly differing uh, opinions on uh, on monty and the way the army uh, ran the campaign but that's just that's just basically what i think anyway so what yeah so what is this what let me excuse me so this is number six isn't it? this is so as i said sorry that's i'm getting bogged down here so by bye 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 the middle of operation epsom 
um, which is 20, so Epsom was 26 June to the 1st of July, where 35 fighter and fighter bomber squadrons were permanently based in Normandy. The air plan had called for 80 squadrons by then, but while the bridgehead was the size it was, air cover was never, a, never, never an issue. All the aircraft based in Normandy could be augmented relatively easily and very effectively by those based in Southern England. And that's an important point. Perhaps it's the important point when it comes to Allied airfields and, uh, and expectations. And the one that Tedder and company repeatedly missed, I think, the Allies were more than adequately supported by the RAF and the United States Army Air Force. Uh, and what they had on the ground suited the, 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 um, the realities on the ground. They didn't need any more um, air, airfields. More airfields were good. More airfields were, were, were always more welcome. But um, as de Guingan said uh, in his book, uh, Operation Victory, he didn't think he, he, that um, he ever heard any promise specifically that the air plan for airfields would ever be, uh, ever, ever be, ever come to fruition in the time period that the airmen uh, uh, expected to. Basically, though, what complicated things was, was again, Monty's pig-headedness. He was a pig-headed bugger. If he'd have been less pig-headed, then things would have been much better for him at the time and later on. Anyway, slide seven, please, Michael. So, Epsom, Charnwood, and Goodwood. So, by the end of Operation Epsom, which was intended to turn the flank of Khan via the Odon River crossings, uh, additional land had been captured, but the operation was widely seen as a failure by those in Shafe, so Supreme Headquarters Allied Expedition Forces, and by uh, elements in the media. And things like uh, the events at Bezbakaj didn't, didn't help either, because that was seen widely then and now as a defeat, which it did, certainly didn't help, but, you know, um, what you've got to bear in mind is Epsom, while it didn't capture much ground, it has to be said, and Carl certainly wasn't captured at the end of it, it did tie down additional uh, troop, uh, troops and panzers coming into, into the line. So Epsom, in fact, it embroiled the 2nd SS Panzer Corps, which had been created specifically uh, by the Fuhrer on the Fuhrer's orders to be used as a spearhead against the Allies when they landed uh, on, at Normandy. But um, as with all good intentions, Luckily for us, uh, the Fuhrer got impatient. He sent them off to uh, the east. And then when uh, the, the soldiers started landing, the Allies started landing in Normandy, he sent them back again. So they had to entrain in, 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 in uh, Eastern Europe, come all the way to Normandy, and then they were introduced in dribs and drabs into the fighting. So that put paid to uh, being, being used as, uh, as one cohesive force. So let's look at the reality, reality of the situation, though. Um, post Epsom. By the time Epsom uh, was finished, approximately 700 panzers in six divisions and other units were deployed in the con sector uh, against the British Canadians. So you set those um, 700 panzers against the 140 panzers or thereabouts facing the Americans. And I think you can demonstrate that Monty, by pulling units away from the Americans, was doing exactly what he intended and what he always said. Remember, captured or masked. Well, it wasn't captured still, but it was still masked and it was still sucking in those, those units away from the American sector, okay? Um, Epsom had put paid to German plans for a concerted counterattack in the Con area. And that's true, they never did actually um, bring those forces together against the British Canadians. They did later uh, against the Ameri against the Americans, and we'll look briefly at that. But they never did it in concert against the uh, the Ang Anglo Canadian forces. The problem was that um, there were many who equated um, land captured to success, and that's the sort of thing that that is that, the, that is still in play today. Many people think that uh, the the Ukrainians, for example, are failing in Russia. Uh, or against Russia uh, because they're not capturing the amount of land that uh, the armchair generals said they should, but they don't need to. And, it, and just like the, uh, the British Canadians didn't need to capture that much land while they were still tying down uh, the people, the, the Germans uh, in, in, in Normandy. Operation Charnwood, um, so that was the, um, the, the plan to capture uh, Caen. So 
uh, Operation Chalmers' conclusion led to the capture of most of Cart on the 9th of July 1944, and it eventually cleared the way for more airfields to be established. But still, those those airfields were being they, they, they fell behind the air plan. In fact, until they broke out properly, the air plan never did come to fruition. To be honest with you, but they, again, it didn't need it. It, it, the, the, the Allies never, ever, ever lacked for air support, and you know I think if anyone, if anything, then it's it, it's it's Tedder and company who show inflexibility and not Monty in that respect. And something else to bear in mind, I think here is that no matter how well that people planned um, uh, Normandy uh, uh, Overlord, the Germans stubbornly refused to fight the campaign the Allies expected. And that is that surprised them, but it shouldn't have surprised them. You have to look from Tunisia onwards when uh, when Hitler reinforced uh, North Africa, uh, even though it was obvious by 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 fairly early on that it was a, it was a busted flush. The Allies thought that the Germans would fight a staged retreat to Seine and beyond, and I think it shocked them that he did, that uh, that they didn't. But the reason they didn't was because. Hitler was in charge ultimately. I think something else to bear in mind as well. We've uh, we've absent. This is one of my little hobby horses here, and again, you know, you've got to forgive me for this. But at the end of Epsom, a lot of people thought that um, the, the, the British had lost their way. In fact, the person Martin Blumenson, he's a I say influential. I suppose he is an influential U.S. Uh, historian, and he wrote one of the official histories of the the Normandy campaign. He wrote this. Whatever Montgomery's intent for Epsom, which was not clear at all to the British or to the Allies generally, had stalled before Kong. The Allies looked to General Bradley's US First Army for operational progress. How he wrote this, knowing all the facts as he did, and he did know them, is beyond me. It's At no stage did Overlord call for the breakout to be launched from the British uh, and the Canadian sector. It was always going to be the American sector when it came. So the, the Allies didn't look to the Americans. The, the Americans were free to conduct operations as they saw fit. Uh, those were Allied, those were Mon Monty's words, and he never pushed them. So the breakout when it came was always going to be from the American side. It's just madness to think otherwise. Anyway, that's just me thinking that. Right then, so Monty came in for a lot of stick for Charnwood because um, there, was a, there was a massive amount of bombing took place the day before. And that bombing was actually not at the instigation of, but at the encouragement uh, of Eisenhower and Tedder. Um, but as we know, um, the bomb line crept forward despite the best efforts of the, of the uh, of, of Bomber Command. And it ended up flattening um, most of Kong uh, without appreciably touching many of the German strong points. So Monty caught out for that as well. Um, but it still tied down lots and lots of German units. Goodwood uh, happened after the eight, but it did capture um, most of, of Caen. So after Good, uh, after uh, Charnwood, the capture of Caen, um, Goodwood came along. So that was between the 18th and 20th of July. And to be fair, it was expected to last longer than that. Um, but it didn't. There was a massive downpour. Um, the, the, the tanks used uh, had to be funneled through a very, very small uh, area, uh, of ge ge uh, geographically speaking, and and, and it did. It, it bogged down because of the of, of, the, of the, the weather. Um, but it was the last set piece attack before the U.S. breakout, and was really intended to take place in conjunction with the Americans. Uh, circumstances on the ground conspired to prevent that because the Americans just weren't ready in time, but they went ahead anyway. And remember, Goodwood was primarily an armoured um, 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 battle because the British Army at this stage were a wasting, a wasting asset. They, uh, they had more tanks, more equipment than they did blokes to uh, fight them and be at the sharp end infantry-wise. So that's why uh, it was predominantly an, an armoured uh, uh, attack. Now, depending on who you think... Uh, who you believe, anywhere between 500 to 700 tanks are largely quoted in the by, by the, uh, the historians and the axe grinders as being lost to uh, to Goodwood. In fact, the uh, according to the, the REMI, the Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineers, the people who were responsible for tank recovery and repair uh, after the battle, 
by their figures, it's around about 156 uh, tanks were ultimately lost. Uh, um, so it's quite a massive um, uh, difference between the, between the two. But the trouble is, the more something is said, and the more often it's said, then the more traction it's given. But 156 doesn't sound quite as dramatic as 700 tanks lost. But again, um, Monty got stick for it. And because of uh, the perceived failure of Goodwood, uh, there was a, a plot, a short-lived plot, has to be said, uh, was put in place to try and uh, and and, and uh, get rid of Monty, uh, but it came to nothing. But the truth is that Goodwood, combined with the previous battles around Caen, served the purpose of keeping German attentions fixed mostly upon the British and Canadians and away from the Americans bottled up around saint Lo. And that was about to change. So slide eight, please. So Cobra and the breakout. So Monty had recognized from the earliest days of his appointment that although he was commander of land forces for the duration of the Normandy campaign, the Americans would be entirely responsible for their own operational planning. And in this, he made it quite clear in one of his first orders, American doctrine is their own affair and General Bradley will act as he thinks most suitable. So Monty stuck to this principle for the duration of the campaign and he never once forced or suggested, or goaded, or prodded, or whatever adjective we want to use, he never once did any of that to Bradley. When Bradley came to him before Cobra, uh, before um, before Cobra kicked off, and said, "You know, I don't think we're going to be ready here, Monty," or words to that effect, Monty turned around to him and he said, "Just take all the time you need, but take all the time you need, Brad, and we'll we'll just we'll just plod on until you're ready to move." And for that, some people believe in that have called him condescending. I mean, I don't know why you'd, you'd say that was condescension, but he has been accused of that. Just after the war, before they, uh, they before they fell out seriously, seriously, um, Bradley even went as far as to say that he couldn't have wished for a more understanding uh, and charitable uh, um, commander than, than, than Montgomery. He's not many people would say that. Of course, that was before they fell out big time. Um, after the war, I mean, they fell out during the the, the, the campaign, obviously. Um, well, I say obviously, but they did. Um, inevitably would probably be a better word with Monty. But at the time, he recognised the sacrificial nature of uh, the Anglo-Canadians in front of Caen, and he went along with that. He, 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 he understood Monty's plan. OK, then. So once General Bradley had gathered the strength of his first army to the point when they were ready to break through the German lines, with Operation Cobra and the subsequent breakout, the Americans had been battering through the lethal Buckage country, incurring fearful casualties in much the same way as their uh, compatriots had suffered in front of Caen. And you can see here on this, I mean, this is one of the reasons I, I chose this, uh, this this photograph. This is a sunken lane here, and this is by no means the worst sunken lane. Um, I didn't want to put, there's one that, that, that I was going to use, but it was full of, of dead horses and people and people hanging out of burnt out uh, uh, trucks. But if you see here, um, or if you can see to the left, as, you look, as, as you're looking at it, you can see an approaching British uh, Sherman um, on, the, the, on the land above the sunken, uh, sunken, sunken pathway, uh, sunken roadway rather. And you can see all that equipment, including dead horses there, because even at this stage of the war, the, 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 uh, the Germans were, were very reliant on horse drawn stuff. And you can see a burnt out pamphlet to the front there. You can see other, other units and other, other, other stuff. That is what the Bocage was. It's sunken lanes uh, surrounded by high, steep banked uh, walls. And that was the reality of what the Yanks were, uh, the Americans, the Yanks, yeah, the Yanks were, were battling through more so than the British. And that yeah, they might have only been facing 140 tanks uh, and whatnot or thereabouts. But it was very, very easy for the uh, for the Germans to bottle them up. So the fact that they didn't get anywhere, it wasn't, or, or not as far, far as they as they imagined they would post uh, pre pre invasion, it's in no way, shape, or form detrimental to the American servicemen. They did their utmost in, with with the equipment and the, and the, the, the practice that they had before the invasion. There's no slur on them. Let's get that out of the way first of all. They did the best they could. Anyway, um, so although uh, facing fewer panzers than the Anglo-Canadians had, the pace of advance for the Americans had been dramatically affected by the buckage and the tenacity of their opponents. 
This is illustrated perfectly by the fact that Salo was originally scheduled by in the US Army's pre-invasion plans to be captured by the 15th of June. In, San Lo, in fact, fell on the 19th of July, six days before Cobra. As the British found before Khan, US forces would discover that no matter how detailed the plan, realities on the ground had a habit of upsetting schedules. It's important to note that Montgomery never once chided or hurried his American allies to alter their plans, uh, as I said earlier. So anyway, weather conditions delayed the start of Operation Cobra to the 25th of July. The plan called for infantry of the American 7th Corps to break through the American German defences along the Lesse to saint Lo Road, keeping each side of the breach open. Follow-up formations would exploit the broken German front line, swinging southwest to the town of Kutans, probably said that wrong, 14 miles from the first day's objectives. From there, the American advance would head further south to the town Avron of, of Avranche on the Atlantic coast. Once achieved, the Contantin Peninsula would be cut off, leaving the way clear into Brittany with its potential potentially useful ports. They weren't as, as useful as they as, as they as they were anticipated in in in, in effect in, in the event, but that's, that's that's another story. So the plan was a major feat of arms by the Americans, and it was a complete success, despite an initially slow start caused but in part by the arrival of the depleted Panzer Air Division into the area. American infantry and armor broke through the German defenses, going on to break into the German rear areas, reaching Avranche on the Atlantic coast on the 30th of July, just five days after Cobra commenced. Um, despite the arrival of Panzer Air, German tanks in the region at the time of Cobra's launch never exceeded 150. That's that's an indication of the success of Monty's plan to keep German, uh, German panzers away from, from the Americans. It never got more, they never had more than about 140, 150 at any time, as despite uh, Panzer Air being, um, being diverted to the American front. Anyway, the Germans went on to launch their only concerted armoured counterattack of the Normandy campaign in the face of the American breakouts, when it's all military logic, remember, uh, the Germans weren't fighting as, as expected, Hitler ordered all the available panzers in four depleted panzer divisions to be launched at the Americans with the intention of driving on Avranche and in so doing cut off the American spearhead in the Brittany Peninsula where they could be destroyed piecemeal. That attack was called uh, Operation Lutish and it was launched on the night of the 6th to the 7th of August and in, a sen in, in essence and essentially it was defeated in the first 36 hours. That said, Hitler again doing these old uh, fewer order bits. He never got tired of that. Um, he ordered the, the attack to renew twice in the next week, and basically they just played to the, to the American to the American strengths. The men of the U.S. Army, aided by effective air support, proved themselves equal and then superior to the attacking Germans. And it's important to bear in mind here that the Germans they proved themselves no more adept at attacking through the Bacage as the Allies had been prior to the breakout. Whether fixed before the Anglo-Canadians or transferred piecemeal to face the growing strength of the US Army, Montgomery's overall strategy of crumbling German armour, either destroying or reducing its effectiveness, had proven to be the correct strategy. By the time Operation Lutish had been defeated, and American armour and heavy equipment, not to mention tens of thousands of men, had been trapped in the fillet's pockets between the Anglo-Canadians and the advancing Americans uh, on the 21st of August, the Normandy campaign was essentially over, although it did take a little while longer for the uh, fillet's pocket to be broken down uh, and the people and the, and the transport to be captured or taken into the bag. Slide nine, please, Maestro. So there we have Rogue's Gallery, Supreme uh, Chef uh, Big Wigs, 1st of February there before Monty started laying out his, his ideas and upsetting people. It's interesting to, to notice you got Lay Mallory in the back there. Lay Mallory there. That's, he was the uh, head of uh, Allied uh, Air Forces, and that's an example. That's one of the few examples I can think of at the top of my head where uh, Monty changed his mind uh, about him. When he first met him, um, Monty called Lay Mallory a gutless bugger. Uh, he didn't like him at all. But as the uh, the campaign progressed, he got quite chummy with him, uh, and uh, and vice versa. Um, he, Monty could change his mind if he absolutely had to. Or he, anyway, um, 
No matter how thorough the plan for normally, the Normandy campaign, the Germans were never likely to act according to Allied expectations and roll over accordingly. They, they just they just weren't. So why 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 are you the surprise that they didn't uh, act um, in in a, in a non-military sensible way is beyond me. As one of Montgomery's biographers and sternest critics perceived, German resistance before Caen and elsewhere, before the general breakout, ensured that German resistance would be much stiffer on the ground than was strategically sensible. It also made the German army's dispositions brittle and inflexible, ready to collapse if enough weight was applied, but unlikely to bend before breaking point arrived. And that's exactly what happened. The Germans fought like blazes. And he swore there, fought like blazes to uh, keep the, the Americans and British at bay, especially the American, uh, the Canadians uh, and British in front of Caen, and then uh, Avron, Chamortin with the Americans. But when that breaking point came, break, it did, and nothing was going to undo that. So Montgomery appreciated the above in a way that no one else was able. His experience of fighting the Germans gave him the moral and professional courage to plan for and fight his enemy to the best of his ability. It allowed him to withstand the criticism frequently levelled at him, but it also made him appear arrogant, which indeed he was. Uh, there's no good argument with that, but it made him appear especially arrogant. Um, so it made him appear arrogant to his enemies and his many critics. For once of a little humility and tact, neither of which came easily to Monty, um, he could have taken Eisenhower and by default tether into his confidence once it was clear that the stated intention of capturing Khan either on the day of D-Day or very shortly after wasn't going to happen and and that indeed captured or masked Kong would serve the allied purpose um but tact and diplomacy and uh, and whatnot that wasn't uh, that wasn't monty's way and it never was as he said before the onset of the war discipline strengthens the mind so it becomes impervious to the corroding influence of fear in this, when he, when he said those words, he was actually referring to the effects of combat training on the minds of, of, of soldiers to, uh, to make them ready for the effects of war. But I think he, he, he had the same uh, outlook himself. He never felt fear. He never felt as if the plan would not work. But if he'd have taken his, his uh, seniors into his, into his confidence, then it would have gone so much better for him. Anyway, as I said, it's not, it's not, it wasn't the Monty way. One of the reasons uh, he said this, uh, uh, if he ever felt fear, he didn't show it. That's the thing to bear in mind here. As Peter Caddick Adams remarked in his book, Sand and Steel, Monty had an egotistical self-belief, but he also recognized, um, as he remarked earlier in the war, that our lads are not killers by nature. He said that just before um, uh, El Alamein. And he was quite correct. Monty's subordinate, General Horrocks, who took charge of British 30 Corps during the battle, also recognised the qualities of the Anglo-Canadian forces. In that, in battle, he, the ordinary soldier, is risking his most precious possession, his life, and he will not only and he will only give of his best if he has confidence in his leaders and, above all, knows what is going on. And Horrocks, um, he had this little uh, little thing he he, he always said. Horrocks um, said that the men under his uh, under his uh, command. Uh, and probably true for the wider allied forces of whichever nationality. He said of 10 men, two lead, seven follow, and one would do almost anything not to be there. It was these men who Monty had in mind when he planned for the campaign, not blindly indoctrinated soldiers of the Third Reich, who in any case weren't that as common uh, as was, was believed. And it was just such men who defeated the German army in Normandy, chasing them across the River Seine and capturing Paris before the planned 90-day completion of the campaign. Of all those at the time of the Allied side, it was perhaps Tedder and his, and his airmen, uh, fellow airmen rather, Cunningham, who demonstrated the least flexibility. Whilst the Allied lines, um, sorry, whilst the Allied lines were where they were prior to the breakout, the number of airfields available to the Allies was sufficient, even if not as numerous as anticipated in the pre-invasion air, air plan. Aircraft based in the south of England were able to provide additional air cover. At no time did the Allies lack for air support or lose the inestimable asset of air superiority. It just never happened. They never lacked for it. It would have come as a massive surprise to the Germans to hear of, of such Allied concerns, scourged as they were night, uh, whenever they uh, showed themselves from dawn till dusk. 
If Monty was guilty of arrogance, which he was, let's make no bones about that, then the air, air, air barons with Tedder at the forefront of their criticisms was just as guilty, or if not more so, of inflexibility. Uh, but through their machinations and their behind the scenes uh, uh, plotting against uh, against Monty and uh, the, the, the line of command, um, they were guilty of, in, in, of endangering the cohesion of the wider Allied coalition. As the, as the then Lieutenant Colonel Tom Coppinger was noted as saying on the subject of coalition warfare from his experience of fighting in Afghanistan decades later, coalitions are not military by nature, they are political by nature. And if we misunderstand that, then we risk forgetting the, that a fundamental requirement is to maintain that coalition. To that end, military leaders of a coalition need to remember that they are holding together a political, a political entity and that cohesion will have a value all of its own. And those words could well have been spoken by Eisenhower as he kept his fractious team together during Normandy and beyond. Similar sentiments uh, should have been considered by the airmen and others who could not or would not recognize the realities on the ground as they dovetailed with the requirements of the men struggling through the bocage through the German defenses below. Whilst the thunderclap presentations could not cover every eventuality, the best, uh, sorry, while the thunderclap presentations could not cover every eventuality despite the best efforts of the planners led by Montgomery and his staff, Monty was right to consider that the plan was an overall success. Caen may not have fallen on D Day but it's doubtful he ever envisaged it would. But it did serve the Allied purpose, even if, it was, if, it was, even if um, they were too late. Um, get my words out, sorry. But it did serve the Allied purpose, um, even if many were too blinded by their dislike of Montgomery and the refusal of the latter to take his superiors into his confidence, especially Eisenhower. And before I finish here, I think it's worth um, bearing in mind history and the good of history why is it that i think it important that monty um should be given the credit he's due well um i think one of the well one of the historians i, I took some notice of um was a person called ea freeman and he wrote as long ago as 1886 that history is past politics and politics are present history and I think the Normandy campaign it proves that point. History isn't just about the implotment of facts and the, the regurgitating of facts. It's about what happens during the, the events in question and after them and whether or not they can be used for a wider political um, uh, way, in a wider political way. And I think that is a perfect, and, and Normandy and Monty's part within the Normandy campaign is a perfect example of that. It matters because through the Bad man of Monty uh, and, and his part within the Normandy campaign. Um, the people under him are also uh, denigrated, uh, and the likes of you know the people like um, let's have a look here: Max Hastings, Anthony Beaver, Stephen Ambrose, the New York Times. They wrote some stinking articles about uh, Monty during the, during the campaign. All these people have had an effect to denigrate and more. It has to be said in denigrating Monty but more importantly, the men under Monty's uh, uh, command. So that's why it's important. The, the, the narrative has been changed by Monty's personality, and it's that that is uh, important to challenge. And that's why I wrote as I did. And that's that's pretty much that. Any questions? Brilliant. Well, thank you very much um, for that. Sorry, I came I, I, I myself there. Um, no, that's actually that's, that's fantastic. And you know, I was about to ask you actually some of those questions. So you, you, you've answered some of my own questions there in, in, in your ending there, uh, which I thought that, that's, that's absolutely brilliant as well. Um, I, I would like to comment as well, just saying about actually, you know, the military commands, you know, it's not just the military kind of come together, it's a political aspects as well that you've you know you, you can pay you can pay politics uh within that kind of army structure of the americans being you know the british and and and, and the like as well it's more complex than you know but we just think people work working together to, you know to fight to fight you know mm. germany but actually it's all politics going on there as well which i think is a really good point and something that i hadn't even considered beforehand because you think i don't know everyone's on the same side but actually there's 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 more going on politically as well in, in in that so so yeah something to think about there anyway um 
we've got I, the, I normally ask the first question, but we've got a question which I wanted to ask anyway. So I'm going to use that as the first question. Go on. And it, it comes from Mark. I think I think you may know Mark um, as well. Checks in the post, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's a really good question as well. I, I, really, I really find it really I kind of well. I, I wanted to ask as well because he said you know, I was intrigued by the comparison with contemporary Ukraine offences, as, as you made earlier. Uh, are there lessons from Normandy that still apply to modern conventional conflicts as well? Absolutely, there are. Absolutely, because it, again, it, it boils down to, and it, it's the same, the same, um, well, not the same, because obviously they, 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 but it's the same sort of armchair people that are, are, are miles away from from, um, from from the conflict who equate um, territory taken with mm. with success. You know, just like uh, Epsom, uh, for, 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 for example, let's pick on Epsom. Epsom, on the face of it, failed. You know, uh, Khan, the, the, the flag at Khan wasn't turned, Khan wasn't reached. Um, on the face of it, there was a massive bloody nose at Villas Bacage when uh, old Michael Whitman uh, managed to wipe out single handedly uh, the, 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 the advanced elements of 7th Armoured uh, uh, Division. Um, but what they don't tell you is that. Uh, as I as I as intimated, it stopped any thoughts of German uh, a concerted German counterattack because they threw in everything they had as they had it instead of wait, waiting one go. It never second second SS Panzer Division, for example, never got used in 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 Toto because again it got in, into piecemeal. And it's the same story in 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 um, in Ukraine. Uh, I'm not an expert in Ukraine. Uh, it, it has to be said, but. The one thing that the just like Monty saying that we must get ashore, the one thing that the Ukrainians can't do is to lose ground or lose significant areas of ground, and they're not doing that. But mm. what the the powers that be, the the, the 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 well, not even the powers that be, the the the, the armchair experts are saying as well. They've they've had all this money spent on them, they've had all these tanks and all this stuff been sent to them, and they're still not forcing the the Russians out. In one respect, they don't need to force Russians out. If they can, for, if they can hang on long enough for the uh, for the for the Russians uh, to have a, a political awakening, then they'll have done their job. Eventually, Putin has got to go either all out, in which case he'll probably in, in, um, risk a, a wider war, and he, and he won't want that. Even Putin won't want that. Or else he'll have to give up with his tail between his legs and try and paint it as a as a victory of sorts. Uh, at, but he won't be able to do any of that if the ukrainians collapse and they're not collapsing they're holding out and they're grinding down they're not pegging out uh stuff like 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 monty said but they are staying in they're a force in being still and they're grinding down the best that the russians have thrown at them and that's mm. all they need to do if they can hold out it, it's not in the same same uh respect as the japanese hopes in the in the pacific war they, they they're not saying they're not saying you know will through through murderous um uh, uh, casualties inflicted on the russians um they'll 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 go, they'll go away and will be it's not the same quite the same as that it's just they are staying in being they're having more stuff sent to them as long as old trumpy boy doesn't get in, in, involved with, with it and they're staying in being and it's the same sort of thing uh, in in ukraine as it was in normandy eventually there'll be a, there'll be a a breakout of sorts it won't have to be all the way over to to, to moscow no no they won't be marching on moscow uh, that was one of the Monty's uh, catchphrases: first all rule of warfare, never march on Moscow." But they would do, they would do, they would do well enough to push the German, the, the, sorry, push the Russians back far enough to the point where even they see that they're on a high into nothing. So the the the, the, the lessons learned in in Normandy are applicable to, to Ukraine and elsewhere. Oh, it's absolutely fascinating. I mean, just so the mention of, of Moscow, I just I just watched the film Napoleon just a minute a couple of days ago. So uh, Moscow is mentioned in that, of course, um, and and the failure of of taking Moscow uh, in that regards. But no, you, I think it's a very important thing. I think actually, then, isn't it that this whole the, the Nordic campaign, Khan especially, reminds us, doesn't it, that we can learn a lot from actually history. We can actually learn actually that we need to be careful by just assessing just maps and changes of maps and land actually but what is going on what's actually happening on the ground well, one uh, of the things i didn't mention there was that when yeah. when when monty um came to present the plan one of the things he did first of all was to lay out uh, a series of phase lines uh from the from the bridgehead to uh, just just short of paris on the scene and 
when he came to, to mark those out, he didn't actually mark those out. One of his uh, one of his officers, whose name escapes me at the moment, said, "Well, where should we put these things?" He said, "Well, it doesn't matter. You just put them where you where you like." And the, the the reason behind it was Monty didn't necessarily think that by day X he'd be there, and day Y he'd be there, and whatever. What he knew in his head, in his heart, or he, he, he hoped in his heart, I suppose, he, even Monty had a heart, uh, was that eventually, at the end of ninety days, they would be in on the scene and onto Paris and further on than that. As it happened, he, he beat that um, by by a considerable margin. I think he was about a fortnight ahead of schedule, but he didn't he didn't care. Put them where you like, because the plan ultimately will be successful. He didn't need phase lines, but he just put phase lines. You need them to a, to an extent. You need to plan logistically where you where where you're going to be, so the logisticians can can get the the, the fuel, the, the the men, the reinforcements, the resupplies to various areas. But he wasn't bothered if he got to to area to, to line A, B, or C, because he knew that by the end of the ninety days he'd get there. And that flummoxed the American the Americans. They didn't want that in, in that those those phase lines there. In fact, Bradley insists they were they were taken away. Which yeah. is sort of uh, of, of ironic because uh, Bradley then went on to say in, in his memoirs that um, that Normandy and France was uh, was was uh, liberated by stages. So, but uh, yeah. <laughs> well, maybe he himself learned himself from that. Uh, the, Perhaps he did. Um, yeah, that, again, just a quick, quick comment. If, if anyone does want to ask a question, please do put it in the comment section. We're happy to answer any questions that come our way. Uh, well, not, not me. I'm not answering the questions, really. Uh, it's Andrew asking the questions. I'm just asking them. Um, but I've got a question, though. And um, it, yeah. it goes back to that, that, that figure that, as you said, that you know, a lot of historians report that it's 600, 700, 700 tanks that destroyed. But actually, the the actually from the statistics from the actually the engineers themselves, it was actually something like one one like hundred and twenty fifty something like that. Like that. Fifty six, yeah. Or there yeah. About. Like, yeah. What, how is that? How do you think that, that 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 discrepancies come about? Because it just seems it seems like a massive a massive difference there. Is, is it, are people just come up with the first things come in their heads with that five hundred figure mark, or was that is that actually a reason why they've come up with a Figure vastly from actually what the 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 actually the, the sources say. Well, from what I've been able to make out, and this is just just me. So if, if mm. bang, somebody else is bound to come across uh, uh, more facts and figures, but what you got to bear in mind is that the um, when a tank was knocked out or abandoned, mm. it wasn't necessarily destroyed. So they, people would bail out. And then they'd make their way back to as well if they could back to the back to their lines. So yeah. leaving behind tanks on the battlefield. As the Remy uh, uh, post-war uh, report makes clear, that a lot of those tanks were then recovered on the day or later when when the action moved on. They weren't not when those that were, were that were abandoned weren't knocked out. Many of them that were knocked out were returned were, were repairable and returned to. Hmm. And then also the American, the, sorry, the uh, the tank parks that the Allies had just behind the lines, they could um, they could replenish what was left. But a lot of the a lot of the initial tr um, um, tank crews returning was was seen as equaling to tanks lost. Oh, and okay, so it's... To five to seven hundred people, to five to seven hundred tanks lost. And also a, a lot of the early returns were were destroyed during the course of the war. And there was a big fire at, uh, at one of the depots, and that burnt a lot of the, the, the a lot of the records as well. Um, but post-war, but the, my point here, my uh, Mike as well, is that a lot of the stuff I'm I'm babbling on about here, they're mm. not hidden in the depths of some musty old archives somewhere. There are lots of things in the archives, even though Monty said I I write I read you know I read no paper, I write nothing. He wrote plenty, but other people wrote stuff as well. And for example, first. Um, um, First Corps uh, order to Third British Infantry Division. They're not hit. That's not hidden. It's right. there. People who want to, to 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 see it. I'm not the first person to to, to come across that. But I, I I I'm but I I am trying to highlight that as an example. There there are lots of things that are, that are taken as gospel have been repeated so often that they mm. they take on a life of their own now. And and, it's, and if we can challenge that, then maybe just maybe. You know, for example, the idea that um, the, the 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 breakout when it came was always going to be from the British side. Ne never, ever the intention when 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 Cossack 
which was the organization that was uh, did the initial planning for, for the cross channel invasion, mm. uh, which was subsumed by uh, Shafe. When they did their plan, and that was head, uh, led by a British general called General Morgan, it was their intention that um, the Anglo Canadians would lead the breakout. But that mm-hmm. changed when, when, when Monty took over. It was always going to be Anglo Canadians bring the, the plans on to them, leaving the Americans wriggle room for when it came. Okay. So, this, and I'm, I'm careful to, to reiterate here me saying that the Yanks were wrong in, in some of them. Uh, I'm not just picking on the Americans, but that is in no way denigrating from the from the the, the, the stuff that the American servicemen went through uh, on the front, just because they weren't facing as many tanks as the as the as the, as the American uh, sorry as the Anglo Canadians were. The Germans, in a way, didn't need as many tanks because a they thought that the main threat came from the British and the Canadians, but also the the the, the fighting in those sunken lanes. Even now, when you go to those sunken lanes, there aren't as many as there used to be, as, as there were in 1944, 45. A lot of them have been, been dug up. But when you see that, that bocage, it's, it's quickly apparent why you only needed a handful of people and, and the occasional tank or an anti tank gun to hold up four or five times that mm. uh, American wise. It was just horrible the conditions they were fighting under. Mm. And when it came to it, and when the Amer- when the Germans t- tried to, 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 to put the boots on the other shoe, to have them t- take you through the bocage, they were just as unsuccessful as the as the Americans and to a lesser extent the British were because there was there's more backage in the American sector than there was in the British, but it was still no picnic if you're trying to advance against that sort of thing. And um, yeah, so it feels as it's something that you've kind of pointed out. I think there is it feels like a lot of people studying this they they go into the sources with a pre assumption already and that, that, yeah. that pre assumption leads their reading of the sources rather than going it with a fresh perspective, I guess. I think that's what's needed these days. Yeah. Monty upsets so many people at, at, <laughs> at the time and later. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it, and it, it, he's just the dislike of Monty. As, 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 uh, and I'm not, I'm not uh, advocating for Monty, you know. Mm. Um, I'm just trying to give uh, him and, and, and the people who fought under him a, a fair crack of the whip. Yeah, you know, um, and a fresh um, perspective as well. I think yeah. as well. I think it's fair. It's to say. And also, I have to bear in mind that post-war as well, uh, and into, into fairly, fairly, uh, fairly recently, the American um, view of uh, the people who fought in the Second World War, especially the Greatest Generation, to say anything against them or their leaders was tantamount to saying that you know yeah. they were you know it was tantamount to heresy. Mm. So you couldn't say anything, even if you really thought that. So. Yeah. You just you couldn't do it, but there is it's interesting enough and stuff I, I came across in in the course of my uh, my my uh, MA. Um, did I mention I had an MA? Uh, <laughs> was that 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 because of the, the time that is, that is separated now between between then and now, and the fact that um, there aren't many left of the Greatest Generation alive, mm. then it has become more possible to, to to say, well, actually. You know, this happened and that happened and this could have happened and whatnot. And more and more American, um, to be fair, more and more American historians are being more even-handed. In fact, there's a, a, a historian called Carlo Deste uh, mm. who um, did, uh, who wrote a very famous and still influential book um, on, on the Normandy landings and the, the subsequent uh, battles. And he was pretty um, scathing about the, 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 the British and Canadians. And there's a chapter um, in, in there called The Price of Caution, in which he basically said that, you know, we had bags of soldiers left. We could have we could have done much more than we did. There was loads of people left in America, in, sorry, in, in Britain, you know, who we could have used. But he has changed his mind over, over, over time. It, there's, a, there's a a magazine uh, called uh, Armchair General. Um, and uh, in that, uh, he actually wrote a series of three articles uh, saying, uh, entitled um, Montgomery, uh, underestimated general of World War II. He's actually changed his tune slightly over the years. I'm not saying he's, he's suddenly, you know, Monty brilliant, but, he's, yeah. but he is um, coming coming more to range to the, to the fact that Monty was, you know, wasn't always the, 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 the idiot or the bad guy, depending on who you, you believe. But, uh, and he's changed his tune somewhat. And it's, 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 um, it's worth it's worth you know bearing that in mind. I mean, w- one of the things that that I don't know if you want to round this up anytime soon, but one of the things that um, most um, struck me um, was there was a, a there was an article by the New York Times uh, in on the, actually on the twenty fifth of July, the day of Cobra, um, and it was it was headlined um, 
cautious. I've got it written down here somewhere. Uh, hold on a second. It was uh, cautious tactics in Normandy scene, basically saying that um, Monty had lost his way. The British weren't getting anywhere, uh, yeah. and the, the Yanks were, you know, chomping at the bit to get going. Even though on the date it was published, Cobra kicked off, and so on and so forth. So the person who wrote that article was a chap called Drew Middleton, a famous New York, New York Times uh, correspondent. Yeah. Years later, in 1976, he wrote another uh, article um, in which he spoke to Bedell Smith, who was uh, Eisenhower's chief of staff and General Eisenhower uh, himself. Uh, and basically, Bedell Smith turned around, bearing in mind that they'd fallen out big style in, in that time. They were still big hearted enough to say, uh, well, Bedell Smith said, uh, there wasn't anyone else who could have got us across the channel and ashore in Normandy. And Eisenhower said in a previous um, interview with with um, with uh, Middleton, no one else could have got us across the channel. Now, yeah. if that's not big-hearted enough, in a way that Monty never could have been or never was, because he, he fell out big style with, with Eisenhower, as you know, after after the war. Um, even they, the people who had no reason to 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 to, to be uh, kind to to Montgomery, even they could say that you know you know what. If it wasn't for Monty, we wouldn't have done it. And I think that tells you everything you need to know. One hundred percent. No, one hundred percent. There's there is another question here uh, from Mark as well, but uh, I don't know. I don't know the time, so maybe a brief answer to this last question mm-hmm. uh, as well. Which I I, I want to ask because I think it's quite an interesting question. Which is how did Montgomery experience the first of all influences generalship? Which I think is interesting. So how did he experience? Yeah, massively. Um, Monty said, um, again, I haven't got the, 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 the exact quote to hand, but um, he, 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 there's a quote um, basically from, from Monty saying that um, in, the, in, the, in the, the Great War, a great leader of men uh, wasn't a great leader unless he'd lost an awful lot of men. Mm. And, that was the sort of, and that was the sort of thing that he was very conscious of. And, he, and his, his whole idea, he knew that the, the British Army in the Second World War was a wasting asset. He knew that it wasn't uh, going to, you know, it wasn't going to get any bigger. It, it reached its apogee come Normandy. There was nothing really left. In, in um, British divisions were broken up towards the end of uh, the Normandy campaign uh, and in 1945 to, to, to give more reinforcements to other people. Don't forget that the war against Japan was still going on. Um, course, and they yeah. expected yeah. To, to, to send men, men and equipment out there. So Monty was very, very conscious, but he was also conscious of of, of, of American people under his command as well. He was, you know, he, he didn't want to to, to 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 waste men on purpose. Like Horrocks said, you know, you're asking the people under your command to give everything, possibly their lives, and in mm-hmm. in order to do so, they have to be believing what it is they're being asked to do. And Mon- Monty was a big believer of that, you know. And don't forget as well, Monty himself had been seriously injured in the, in the opening month, the weeks of, of, of the First World War. He got shot through the lung. He was out in no man's land for a while and then brought back in. He, so he was he was he knew at first hand what what it was like to be an infantryman at the front yeah. at the sharp end. So yeah, yeah, I, I think that's, that's that's true for a lot of lot lot, lot of uh, even in in politics, wasn't there? There's a lot of the mm. the memories of the First World War influenced a lot of us was going on in that period so it's a good question to ask though because we often don't think do we we often we often separate the two but actually there's a big strong connection there so that's a good question as well but we will have to end there just because of because of time uh we have we have done very well actually but um so i just want to say thank you to everyone who's been here and to all those who are here later on as well i know people will watch this later back later on as well uh, and thank you, uh, especially to our speaker, Andrew, for a brilliant and fascinating talk and a well-delivered talk as well. So thank you so much thank for you, that. I, I really enjoyed it. I, um, something that I know a bit about, but not, you know, I now, I now feel more confident about that period to, to talk about to, to, to those around me. So thank you so much for that. And to also think about these things afresh as well, a fresh, a fresh perspective is so important. And I, I, know, I hope that, you know, this can be taken on further at some point as well because i think we need these fresh, these fresh, fresh perspectives uh more in in in, in academia as well so so thank you and so much for that uh andrew um just a comment we, we our last talk for, before our winter break uh is in two weeks time and that is on the civil war not by uh, not by me uh but the english civil war but not not by me so do stay tuned for that because that that, that i'm looking forward to that as well because 
and that's my time period so that being said thank you everyone for being here and we will see you hopefully uh, very soon at another history indoors talk so, so, that, so thank you for me and thank you to andrew as well so thank you bye for now. Bye. Bye.